Okay, so um, it is six o'clock. I'm going to call the June 8th, 2021 regular uh, meeting of the CV Fiber Governing Board to order. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Ray? So, um, Jeremy, we've talked about having a special meeting on Thursday. <laughs> right. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, today, the final contract um, uh, agreement for the work orders to do the polls inventories has been approved by the vendor. And so we'd like to be in a position that the board approves the um, approves them and um, blah, blah, blah. And having said that, in addition to that on Thursday, I, I think that, you know, we've got an agenda that's really um, much longer than any of us, I think, can tolerate anymore. I'd, I'd like to propose that going public at 7.35 and uh, CV Fiber Network discussion at 8.05, we move to Thursday uh, in, the special, um, in the special meeting. I think that'll take some bite out of this and we can, we can attend to the other things that we need to do. Uh, and that'll give us the time to do those other things properly. I think that makes sense. Uh, any Anything else that folks think maybe we should move to Thursday, Jeremy? Uh, I think that if I do the math correct, we would need to warn that like now. Is that right? No, no, nope. no. We would need to warn hours? it by tomorrow. It's not a regular okay. meeting. So this is like an overflow special meeting. So this is us putting putting together the meeting so that we can deal with these contracts. That was the original purpose of of this special meeting that Ray and I were talking about for Thursday. It's just that because this meeting has gotten very, um, very long, um, I don't really want to be here until 9 p.m. I think you, the rest of you probably would also not want to be here until 9 p.m. So let's take a little bit of the pressure off of this and put it on, on, that, uh, on that agenda if the rest of you don't mind. Um, are there, is there anything else that makes more sense for us to move to Thursday? I mean, I, yeah, Siobhan? Would we be starting at six on Thursday? Uh, I'm I'm flexible. I'm not I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to be at home. So I may be running it from my from my phone, depending on um, um, depending on my internet access situation. Okay. But uh, I'm I'm flexible. If there's a better time for everyone, this would be the time to to say something about it. Would you rather go later, earlier? I mean, I'm going to be in the sense I don't of time. care. Okay, Michael. Um, so I guess I'll go against the flow. I, for one, would prefer a long meeting rather than two meetings um, in general. Um, in, partic in this particular instance, I, I have a conflict for Thursday, but um, our Plainfield delegate will ably represent us. Um, but that's that's my preference. I, I don't scheduling multiple meetings in a week is hard. Um, I'd rather have long ones and get the work done in general. So, the, so the, the reason that we're holding the Thursday meeting is because we have some last minute contra uh, contractual stuff that we couldn't include that's substantial enough that we couldn't include in the warning for this meeting, like stuff that came yesterday and today. We're having a Thursday meeting. I mean, so I, I understand right. it may conflict and I, I don't really want, I mean, I'm not going to be home. So like I said, this is, it's going to be awkward, but hopefully aside from the, the discussion of the, the networking plan and, and otherwise, um, there shouldn't be too, too much else. Um, the approval of the contract should be rather straightforward, I think. So, um, so I guess if, if it's okay with others, my preference is to not move agenda to Thursday um, and make the Thursday meeting really short, but that's my preference. Okay. So Ray, Ray pitched the, uh, okay. moving the stuff to Thursday. Michael would prefer to keep the, the meet in today's meeting and keep Thursdays very short. Any other preferences one way or the other? Alan? Jeremy, what time will the Thursday meeting start? I think I missed that. I, I, I don't have that set. I was just, I was going to, ask everyone else what their druthers were. We can certainly start okay, a bit because, later. I know you prefer that. Well, I, I actually have another meeting on Thursday night. It starts at seven. So if we're going to do a CV fiber meeting one, you know, 5.30 or six would be better this time around. It's all the same to me. So I see David giving the thumbs up for that, Jeremy. 
I can't meet before six. Okay, let's let's so just do six to seven. For, so that might be an argument for trying to get through as much as we can today, so we don't run out of time. So, on Thursday. so, so, so tell you what, rather than belaboring this and taking another ten minutes out of our agenda today, um, let's let's plan tentatively that if we are running late, we will. I'll take the temperature of the room. My room is very hot right now, so we'll take the temperature of the room, see what everybody feels like when we get to about. 8.05 or 8.15, and if everybody's feeling flattened, then we will um, offload this stuff to Thursday, and we'll start at 6, because that's what when we would normally start it anyways. And I think that's going to be making the most sense for everybody. Ray? That makes yeah, so, sense. Um, so hey, assuming, thanks, that thanks, we, assuming we proceed on that particular um, uh, logic here, my, my preference would be to move the going public to um, after the CV fiber network plan discussion. Okay, yeah, and that's and that's doable too. So I, I have that on, on a list of my notes from when we talked earlier. So um, if we do, um, if we do end up pl plowing through this tonight, then you know, we'll, we're gonna we're gonna kick the the going public item to the end because it's going to be somewhat contingent on the other the other items there as well. Um, anything else that we should be doing with the agenda? Okay, terrific. Um, let's move on to public comment. And if any of you have anything to say about items that are not on the agenda, that's great. I think I would like to, um, uh, so David and Chuck will, will give you a chance to, to to make your comments in just a second. I wanted to give um, two new faces an opportunity to introduce themselves if they're, if they're so inclined. Um, we have uh, Becky from Woodbury and Tabor from Marshfields. So Becky, would you start, give us maybe a little intro about yourself um, and uh, just so we know who you are. Sure, um, I moved here last uh, August from spending 12 years in Colorado. I'm a native Texan, but Colorado became so overrun with people. I said, where can I go and live in the mountains but not have people? And Vermont was the answer. <laughs> so I looked for 14 months pre-COVID and I said, I, I'm going to wait until I find just the right place. And I found this beautiful home on Greenwood Lake in Woodbury. So I moved here and then I saw an email um, just a couple months ago that the town needed somebody to represent them on this board. And I thought, well, I have terrible internet here. I'll get on this board and see if I can help nudge something along. So. Thanks for having me. I'm going to be kind of learning all the details from from all of you. So I appreciate your patience. All right. Thanks very much. And I should mention, if I haven't mentioned this already to either of you, Becky or Tabor, the um, there is a there are a bunch of uh, like webinars that were put on earlier this year. If I haven't sent those to you, send me send me an email, um, and I will send you a link with all of those. And that's a, that's a great way to ramp up. Uh, Jeremy, you have something before Tabor goes? Yeah. I just wanted to say first, Becky, that that's a big part of the reason why a lot of us are on the board, I think, is because of terrible <laughs> internet. Um, so welcome. Uh, the other thing that I was wondering is if you'd be willing to give us the spelling of your last name uh, for inclusion in the minutes. Sure. Uh, it's Browning, B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Tabor, you're up next. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm Tabor Allison. I live in Marshfield. That may or may not be visible on the screen. Um, I'm a recently appointed alternate uh, to the committee. Um, and uh, of course, <laughs> it sounds like a broken record, but I, I guess uh, just to let everybody know uh, you know so this is we're all in good company here about uh, concerns about our internet i uh, work from home and have worked from home uh, ever since i took my new job uh, working for a small nonprofit, which enabled me to move uh, from concord massachusetts uh, back in 2011 to uh, vermont and have been living in my current home since uh, 2013. Becky, interested that you're from Colorado. I moved to Massachusetts from Colorado uh, back at the turn of the millennium. Uh, so 
uh, at some point be interested to know where in Colorado you were from. But anyway, I uh, appreciate uh, being able to participate in this uh, group. I was recently appointed by our select board. So uh, I am interested in getting a link to those webinars. I have a lot Terrific. of catching up to do. John inundated my inbox with, oh, here's some more background information for you. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot to catch up on. Great, great. Well, welcome to both of you. Thanks for putting your hats in the ring. We have a lot of moving parts going on right now. So you're, you're coming in at a uh, very, uh, let's say, high, high velocity time, we'll say. Okay, so uh, Chuck and David, you had a couple of other things, Chuck? Yeah, I just wanted to provide a quick update to the board that I, I presented to the Moortown Select Board last night about a potential appropriation of uh, ARPA funds. Um, towards CB Fiber, um, and it, it, they were incredibly receptive to the idea. They would not commit to any specific amounts yet because they haven't figured out how much they're going to get, and they sort of looked at our calculations and said, well, that's nice, and, and I don't blame them, uh, but uh, everybody across the board on the select board is in favor of appropriating some funds toward us. Uh, it will likely take a little bit of time, um, and of course, as many of you know, uh, the, the league is actually sort of recommending the towns to really take their time and, and choose slowly on this. And of course, Karen Horn, our Moortown alternate, is uh, both highly involved in the league and both highly has the, uh, and also highly has the ear of our select board. So I'm sure they will be following that guidance of the leagues, uh, but I'm quite certain we, we uh, should stand to receive some amount of funding from, from the town of Moortown. David? Yeah, I just want to give a couple of updates that are not on the agenda because the committee, the Planning and Development Committee hasn't met. But we got eight proposals for high level design that came in last Friday. And so we'll be reviewing those in the next few weeks. And then the um, our draft RFP for an operator or manager has gone through. I should, we should be getting the second round from the um, three consulting services we're getting from Carol Monroe and, and Alex Kelly tomorrow. So that committee, that group will be meeting on that shortly. Just wanted to give everybody an update. Things are moving. Wonderful. Thanks for that, David. Any other uh, updates that aren't uh, stuff that's not on the agenda? Okay, great. So let's move on to um, the consent agenda. I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented, which includes the approval of the May 11th minutes. Second. Yeah, that's seconded by Jeremy. Any further discussion? Any objections? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Treasurer's report, Jerry. You're muted. Sorry about that. I'm working on a single screen. I'm not used to it. Uh, yeah, so let me go quickly through the treasurer's report because this part is uh, relatively boring and there's some more interesting information that'll be coming up shortly. Uh, so we um, we, we uh, have our, our I, oh, also one other thing, I, I apologize, but I did send out a revision earlier because I had uh, copied over a wrong table onto the previous report. Uh, some minor changes, but I apologize. So you can see the bank balances, the the savings, and the checking. Uh, Jeremy, you have that information. I don't need to read it out, right? Um, Every, we have, everybody should have that. Yeah. Yeah. We have we have at the moment no outstanding invoices, um, which is which is quite interesting. Um, it's not going to stay like that. So our grants and funding update for the administrative grants that we've been working with, we have the PSD grant and what you see on that table with $18,053 remaining is exactly the same set of numbers that I sent to Rob Fish on the 30th of May or whatever that Friday was. Uh, so this is, this is where we stand with this particular grant. Uh, one point that I would I would like to make here, when if if anybody is you know pouring over these numbers, unofficially, 
um, we've received information that up to 15% of the total grant amount, so for the $160,000 grant, uh, 24,000 can be moved uh, from one category to another, which gives us just the right amount of flexibility we need to squeeze every dime out of this grant. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, to bring that to folks' attention. So we will use all eighteen thousand dollars out of this grant. I'm pretty sure. Uh, for the can I jump in here real quick, Jerry? Yeah, please. Uh I, um, we should probably follow up with Rob to make sure that that's the case for this grant. I was specifically talking to him about the other uh, H315 and the H360 grant. So it could very well be the case for this as well. Um, but I think I think I should just cross that T, dot that, dot that I. I. I agree. I, I hope I said unofficially, uh, we do right. need to follow up and get that written down uh, somewhere. And then for our general general operating support grants, which is an, our amalgam of uh, previous grants from various places over the past two years, uh, we have approximately thirty thousand uh, dollars remaining in that. So in total, at the moment, um, we have forty eight thousand forty eight thousand dollars remaining in our administrative grants, um, which is working out very well for us that's uh that's a good number to have and i'll, I'll take any questions if there are any a anybody uh siobhan i'm 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 seeing a lot smaller people so if you have your hand up you can just, just um so the the questions you're taking are just on this portion of the report right sure because there's something lower to... down I didn't understand, so when we get there, I'll, I'll ask that. Okay, so we have two two other tables to follow. Um, one one is the the budget as we've as we've laid it out from now to the end of the fiscal year, and then the next one is where we are as far as what we've budgeted, and what we've spent, and 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 what is remaining that hasn't been spent. So. Siobhan, I'm happy to take your question now. So the first table on the top is what we've, what we've, uh, I'm, okay, so in the second table, what I'm confused by are the over slash under annual budget columns. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that enough to understand for sure what that means. So does that mean that we are, we have 27,000 left? or we're over 27,000 over budget. I, I'm it, sorry, I'm that, not an accountant. Neither am I, Siobhan. <laughs> so the over under columns, and that's a really good question. The over under columns, if there's a positive number in there, which they all happen to be positive numbers at the moment, that means we've underspent. We have so, residual okay. monies from our budget in the amount of year to date, Nine thousand nine hundred and twenty-nine, and over the over the annual budget, twenty-seven thousand five hundred. Okay, that that that's all I needed to know. I guess that was my question. If they, if it were negative, that would be bad. So okay. Well, it would just mean we've overspent our 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 budgeted allotment. That's right. Right. So yeah, yeah. that's an okay, excellent question. You. Actually, I asked it of myself. Okay. Any other questions for Jerry? Okay, I'm gonna take this down then. All right, thanks for that, Jerry. Um, let's see, moving along. Uh, clerk's report, Jeremy. Yeah, sure. So uh, the first thing is the invoice from CVRPC for uh, um, their services for the April 1st through April 30th period. That was three hundred and seventy-two dollars and thirty-four cents, um, and I think that was quite a lot lower than the previous month uh, because we only had one meeting. Um, obviously, the more meetings we have, the higher that number is going to be. Uh, the other thing that I've completed is I have gone through all of the back minutes that I can locate, and I have loaded them onto the website, um, and rather than spam everyone's emails with uh, 
you know, everyone who's on the public notice list with new email or with emails um, describing or uh, sorry did not sleep well last night my brain is not working anyways um, so rather than spam everyone with uh, draft and then final uh, minutes for I'm just going to be posting them to the website um, that's all that's required by uh, the open meeting laws um, so going forward they will be posted to the website uh, once they're available um, the other things that have been keeping track of town representation and one thing I'd like to point out is that uh, Barry City, Elmore, Middlesex, and Williamstown have all not been represented for any of the last four meetings. Uh, that's including this meeting, so the three meetings prior to this one. Um, and that is all that I had. Uh, are there any questions? Anything for Jeremy? Okay, and uh, speaking of the the uh, cities that don't have or cities and towns that don't have representation here, this was something that Ray asked that we put on this agenda, and that was something that I opted to um, delay until our, a later agenda because I was pretty get, uh, getting busy. Do we want to um, push back on those folks that don't show up and ask select boards, city councils to replace them? That's that's a discussion that we'll have on an agenda at a future meeting. Uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, R. D. Would you do us a favor and could you just could you mute? Um, we're getting feedback from your line. Okay, hang on. Thank you. Okay. So um, if there's nothing else for Jeremy. Let's move on to readoption of CV Fiber Rules of Procedure. Uh, Alan, I'll let you drive this one if you like. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, so uh, we can do this fast if there are questions that'll slow us down, but questions are always good. You can think of this document as um, both an oath and a confession. And the confession follows taking the oath when you realize after reading this, all the things that you might not have done right during a committee meeting or in how you did a vote or whatever. It really is a good idea to reread this thing every year. We're not gonna do it aloud now, but there's a lot of good basic information that just tells you how the organization runs, including whether you can call a question during the meeting in order to limit discussion. You will find the answer to that. I think it's on page five, if I remember. So there are all these small things in there that I think most of us forget about even when we read it, uh, you know, in the middle of winter, I think six months later and certainly a couple of years later, we just forget everything that's in there. So I would really suggest that, you know, sometimes just sit down and read the thing so you at least know what there, what what's there. You don't have to remember it. You just have to know that there is information about something there. I wanted to point out what's changed. They're all noted the changes that have been made to the document over time, you know, from the original document, all the changes are noted in notes that are on the bottom of page four, and there is a note on the bottom of page five. Basically, the name of the organization changed from um, Central Vermont Internet to CV Fiber, officially that is. Then we had an addition of a new section recently that most of you probably remember on governing board committees, which is section J. That was, a, that was a, uh, amended in May of this year. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them, but all we, all we have to do is to promise we're gonna read this and remember it's there. So I move that we adopt the CV Fiber Rules of Procedure as presented by Alan. Second. 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 Seconded by Siobhan. Any further discussion? Jeremy, I have one comment. Yes. And I'm on uh, page one, paragraph three, second line. There should be a comma after unless. You see that, Alan? Yeah, yeah. Hardy, I think you're right. 
it certainly makes sense to have it there. So I think we can do that as a, as a friendly amendment. Appreciate it, RD. Yeah. All right. Anything else? So um, we we are obliged to adopt this by statute. We're obliged to adopt this every year. So what I will try to do is I will try to add this to our agenda after we're uh, electing chairs and vice chairs at the main meeting. It's just a, and RD, can I ask you to mute again? Thanks. Um, that's just something that it's it's a nice it's a nice way if we get an, anybody new we can sort of uh, just do this once a year and we don't have to uh, don't have to remember hopefully. Um, okay, so the motion is out there. There's no further discussion. Are there any objections to adopting the rules of procedure? Okay, I will take that as unanimous approval. Thanks for that. Um, Alan, you still have the floor. Uh, Policy Committee, would you tell us about voting in meetings? Sorry, I thought I was going to be quiet for a while. You want... Oh, actually, you want to, uh, you want to I, I, I'm sorry. I actually, I jumped one, but this actually makes sense to put here anyway, so go ahead. Okay. So you're referring to the vote uh, for vice chair, is that correct, at the last yeah. meeting? Yeah. Yeah, just just to kind of get everybody filled in as to why we're doing this and you know, why, why this is an agenda item again. Well, so basically what happened was I had somebody contact me and ask about the process for voting for vice chair uh, at the board meeting back in May. And the question dealt with the nature, the, the, the lack of privacy uh, in the voting in that the way we voted, although we were approximating what people think of as a secret ballot when you vote by paper, you know, a paper ballot, it was secret to all of us, but it wasn't secret to the person who had to do the counting, which happened to be Jeremy, because he was able to see names when we all sent our vote uh, to him via chat. So the question was, how can we have a process that's that that where secrecy is uh, promised but but doesn't get delivered essentially? Um, I don't think anything was intentional on this, but it, it raised a lot of interesting questions about the difference between virtual meetings and traditional in-person meetings. Because when I started when I started researching this. I realized that we cannot have secret votes. We are required by state law to have public votes and for the minutes to reflect when there is a vote, uh, how we voted, how each of us voted. So the question is not a question of privacy. The question is, how do we have to vote in the future for vice chair? And the answer is we have to have a roll call vote or else it, or else it can be a unanimous vote as well. If it's not a contested election, uh, there can be a unanimous vote the way that Jeremy's been running um, the meetings by, uh, by having, without seeing objection, the motion passes. But one assumes when two people are running for one position that it's a contested election and it's not unanimous. So therefore you have to have a roll call vote and the vote has to be, um, the vote has to be recorded and it has to appear in the minutes. The policy committee, I, I reported this, this to the policy committee and everybody agreed, you know, if that's what it says we have to do, that's what we have to do. And um, there's, no, there's no exception that I can see where you can, where a public body can vote, can vote in, in secret as it were. Right. Um, does anybody have any questions about the, the process that we're about to go through? Okay. Thanks, Alan. I think that was that was completely clear um, okay. to me anyways. Okay. So um, we, we did skip an agenda item, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so we're going to rerun the election of the vice chair as if we were doing it uh, like we did last month. So. Um, I would entertain any nominations for vice chair. Nominate Siobhan. 
Okay. So Chuck nominates Siobhan. Thanks for that, Chuck. Are there any other nominations? And RD, can I ask you to mute again? I, I, I think I am muted. Okay, because I, I can hear myself talking through back through your line. So I don't know if you have if you're on speaker or if you have a headset or something. A headset would be better. I have I can't I have no headset for this. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can also hear okay. myself when I talk. Just mute him, Jeremy. Okay. Um, I, I I don't want to just I mean. I, I don't really want to mute him because if I mute him, I don't have any idea whether he, if he wants to say something, I have no way of getting he'll that information. He'll unmute. If I mute him, he can't unmute himself. That's like, an, that's like an admin privilege. So it's it's sounding good right now though. So I, I, I think we're good. Jeremy, you, you had something? I was just gonna point out, I'm was going to ask RD to mute because I'm okay. really, really tired and can't focus with the feedback. So, okay. Sorry. Cool. All right. So, um, any other nominations? Yeah. Alan? I would nominate Tom. Tom Pichon. Okay. All right. Tom, do you accept the nomination? I appreciate the, uh, the comment there, Alan. Um, but no, I think. Um, I'm glad to, to see us move forward with a process that is recognized by state law and everything. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, we've already had this discussion. Now it's just making sure we dot the I's and cross the T's. So. Okay. I'm good. Thanks, Tom. Any other nominations? Hearing none, um, objections to appointing Siobhan to be the vice chair. I guess there's not really, there's not really a way to object without another candidate. So um, we have <laughs> unanimous consent then. So thanks everybody. And thanks Siobhan for serving in that role. Um, let's jump Thank you. back. Let's jump back to what um, the one that I skipped, which was committee appointments and approving committee chairs. We had agreed that um, in addition to, I should say in conjunction with allowing the committees some um, flexibility in choosing their own chairs that the governing board would essentially come back and recertify and approve the appointment of those chairs. So, um, so let's see, we have, um, I'm going to move that we um, approve the chair positions for um, Ray for the Finance Committee, Alan for the Policy Committee, David for the Planning and Development Committee, Chuck for the um, Communications Committee, and that's our, that's our four, right? Second. Okay, seconded by Jeremy. Any further discussion? Tom? Um, it came up at the last executive committee where um, David wasn't able to make it, and I, as standing vice chair, was able to speak and, and be involved. I just didn't know if we have a formal rule around vice chairs of committees and if that person is not being formally accepted by the board, then should that person be allowed to act in the chair's stead should the chair not be there? Well, I, if I recall what Alan said is that you know Robert's rules, which we are uh, which we're abiding by, says that the vice chair can act in the capacity of the chair uh, we have a statutory requirement though on the executive committee that you have to be a you have to be a member of the governing board in the first place so i think as long as those two check boxes are checked um i'd be happy to go and explicitly approve vice chairs as well um otherwise i'm not sure that that we need to if does anybody have a strong feeling one way or the other alan yeah the, jeremy matt and i have been having a conversation back and forth about this i think we should have approve them. Um, there's a question whether a vice chair can serve on the executive committee in lieu of the chair. And what I've told Jeremy is I think we're dealing with two separate committees here and the the power of the committee to have the vice chair take on the power of the chair when the chair can no longer be there, I would argue extends only to that committee, that it doesn't extend to another committee that by dint of procedure 
the vice chair might normally be be able to serve. I each committee really is kind of you know it's kind of a repository of of um uh longevity with the organization it's it's the chairs are largely people who have been who've been around the block for a while and it's always possible that a vice chair could end up in a position where they have very little knowledge about what is going on and how to vote and i just think there ought to be another another procedure for how a vice chair how somebody can serve on the executive committee who's not the appointed chair that's what i'm that's what i'm suggesting i guess maybe we could we could we could approve we could approve vice chairs and say something about giving them equal powers not only for the committee they they serve on as vice chair but for any other committee to which they they may um, they may serve or we could change something in the rules if people want to do that. But I think I think there's a bit of a problem here with how the ascension from from a committee to a more powerful committee could happen. I, I, I told Jeremy, we had this funny thing at the policy committee last week or whenever that was, two weeks ago. We there, there, There's a young woman who, who I'm going to ask in a moment that she be appointed to the to the policy committee her name is Alexis Julian and she was she came to the meeting I, I invited her just to see what the policy committee does after we 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 started choosing chair and vice chair and I I was nominated and 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 approved for chair and then when we tried to find a vice chair nobody wanted to do it until somebody suggested hey why don't we have Julian do it and <laughs> poor Julian who who had now spent a total of 10 minutes uh, at a CV fiber meeting and did not have vast knowledge of what the organization did. I mean, really nice person, and I think should be great. But it, it it struck me as it struck me as sort of an inside joke that maybe the Julian wasn't an inside joke. And if she were to end up on on something like the executive committee, she'd probably wonder what the heck kind of organization is this. Um, so I, I I think just because of the nature of how we've set up the choosing of the members of the of the executive committee we're going to continue to have burps like this and i think we ought to pay attention to them okay so ray yeah th there's a technical bit to this as well and that's the uh, executive committee is made up of delegates <laughs> so um, and so a vice chair could be an alternate and or it could be somebody who just became a volunteer appointee and that would be an so issue I'm I'm going to make the the hopefully not radical suggestion that the policy committee takes this and comes up with something se semi semi concrete. Oh, we love, we love yeah. these. Um, uh, because I, I I don't think that we're probably ready to um, approve anything about that tonight. I mean, I agree. I, I, absences from the executive committee are sufficiently rare that I think this is this is probably not something that we're going to have to worry about you know so that we have to tap into vice chairs to meet, meet quorum or anything like that i mean um david was traveling and that that's that's going to happen every now and then but um i think we have enough people on the executive committee that that show up for all the meetings that we should be we should be good i'm thinking so alan if you want to gnaw on that with the rest of the policy committee i think uh we maybe follow up with you later on that if that's okay Sounds like a good bone. Okay, and uh, so we have we have this this motion. Uh, any further discussion on the appointment of the the or the confirmation of the appointments of the chairs? Okay. Any objections? Okay, I'm going to read that as passing unanimously. Thanks for that. Um, there is a committee appointment, at least one that we need to do. Alan, would you like to take the helm again? Yeah, I'd like to nominate Alexis Julian, uh, who is a state employee, a recent Norwich graduate, 
she would like to serve on the policy committee and I think she'd be great. She has experience in uh, cyber stuff as well as um, writing policies actually. So it's it's very interesting set of skills. Second. Okay, that was seconded by Jeremy. Any further discussion on appointing Alexis to the policy committee? Okay, not hearing any commentary. Or is, are there any objections? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for that. You. Are, there any, are there any other appointments to committees that we need to sort out now? Okay, not seeing anybody leaping out of their seats. Let's move on to uh, alleged violation of the open meetings law. Um, and we are, thankfully, we are quite ahead of time. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, do we need to approve vice chairs as well? Or is it just chairs that are approved? That was that was what I was essentially kicking over to policy, so that oh, they could. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so so they could come up with. Do, okay. Is that something that we want to do? I think it's. I, I think it's just chairs. Okay. So so okay. for now it's just chairs. If we decide that we need to add yeah, vice chairs sure. later, we'll we'll sort that out later. Okay. So okay. um. I sent out a um, I sent out the email that I got with a, an alleged violation of the chairs, open meetings yeah. law, and um, we are obliged by statute to address the allegation. And the allegation, in short, was that in a recent executive committee meeting, we went into an executive session to discuss a contract, and the complainant claimed that the thing that we were discussing was not in, not in fact a contract. Um, my argument is that we so we were talking about the memorandum of understanding slash contract which is exactly the way we were talking about it in the executive committee meeting we'd been talking about it as a contract before that um and then so i i went to this helpful legal resource that that i know of called wikipedia which um, tells me that memorandums of, memoranda of understanding can be contracts and i actually just sort of informally floated this to a couple other people who are more legally savvy than I, um, and I'm happy to go through the actual things that make a, an MOU a contract. I don't think that's necessary. The thing that we're that we're discussing, the thing that we are hopefully going to be approving tonight, that you have seen, has all of the features of a contract. Um, it's been reviewed by a lawyer as if it's a contract. We wanted to use slightly softer language and call it an MOU, mainly because. Um, there was some anxiety that like sort of offering a town a contract would be scary or something like that. But it's a, we're calling it a memorandum of understanding with elements of, um, you know, an offer, acceptance, consideration, and this, and a legally binding, you know, agreement that we understand each other about how the funding's gonna work. So I am very comfortable that the process that we went through at the executive committee meeting was done completely above board and according to the open meetings law. And there's a process that if uh, the complainant wishes to escalate this, that they are um, they are able to avail themselves of that. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Siobhan? Just reconfirming contract discussions, the, the, the issue isn't that it was a contract discussion so much as premature disclosure of the contents of this thing would harm us in a material way. Is that the actual wording that allows us to go into the executive session? I'm just trying to remind myself about this. So yes and no. One of, one of the things that we can go and discuss while finding that premature discussion and so on and so on is you know, personnel matters, contracts, um, but the fact is the statute says contracts. So we are, we were invoking a particular statutory um, requirement to go into executive session um, and that statutory carve out that I cited says contracts. Yeah. Language because that we were using in kind of informally said it was a memorandum of understanding. In fact, this thing was a contract. I'm not I'm not a lawyer, but I thought contract was like the umbrella term and there were there were several types of agreements that fell under contract and MOU would be that. That's what you're saying at this 
That's what I, you I, think. I think the, I think the Venn diagram is probably overlapping and separate somewhat, okay. but, but I, I don't know that we need to go into the legal okay. um, the legal weeds on this just now. But um, my my finding as the person who presided over the meeting and made the motion um, was that this was a this was all done properly and i'm happy to there is a process if if y'all don't think that that's the case we can circle back around and there is a feature in statute to remedy this um if you feel like we need to do that okay so i'm hearing acceptance of my justification and i'm hoping then that that sticks a fork in it and we're done so let's move on. Uh, next one is items to add to the operational budget. And there's uh, two things for, for this. Uh, one is the Microsoft suite. Um, and then the other one is an advertising budget. And I think, um, Chuck, you can probably take both of these, can't you? I can. Uh, so the first one being the my suite of Microsoft tools. Um, the string of Gmail and uh, Google Drives and lots of different email addresses is really starting to be a bit problematic, uh, particularly as we are starting to uh, get under some additional scrutiny and, and there could very well be a scenario in which um, discovery has to occur in the future and people get to poke around in our emails. I'm sure most of you would like that to not be your personal emails. Um, so, you know, we, we uh, really need to bite the bullet and go ahead and set up uh, emails. We're also doing a lot more um, documents and, and sending things around. Um, and uh, this would allow us to centralize our email and document storage. Uh, it would also, by just purchasing this, uh, we would be able to migrate off of GoToMeetings into Microsoft Teams uh, and actually reduce the ongoing GoToMeeting expense. Um, and so what we are proposing is basically every delegate, every alternate, and a few additional people would receive uh, an email address dot net uh, domain. Okay. And then we're looking at, a, yep, you're back. Okay. What was the last thing people heard? Um, the the cvfiber.net domain. Oh, okay, uh, that was pretty much all of it. Um, so yeah, uh, the cost of this will be anywhere in the ballpark of four to seven thousand dollars annually. And the big driver in the discrepancy there is whether we have certain people on the board who have justification for what are referred to as the thick clients or desktop apps versions of the Microsoft Office suite. Now, there are a lot of us who have access to those tools already and don't mind continuing to use our existing um, Office suite. And, and you know, there, there are some unfortunate side effects of doing that operationally, but uh, generally speaking, um, if you don't need it, I would ask that you not ask for it, but if you have a legitimate need for uh, one of the desktop apps, um, that is something we could provision for you. So thinking specifically about the uh, project manager, uh, whoever comes into this project management position, is it, it's going to be a must-have to have the desktop apps, I'm sure. Um, and so, you know, we'll we'll see if they come with their own or not. And if they don't, then we would bite the bullet and, and incur that additional charge for them. Um, and uh, the policy committee, uh, I think, would need to come up with um, some guidelines as to what the uh, uh, rules are around whether somebody is eligible to receive that or not, or we could keep it a little more informal if we if we wanted to. Um, I'm, I'm open to ideas, but that's it in a nutshell. Uh, everybody would get access to the online versions of the document editors, the online document storage, the Microsoft Teams uh, collaboration tool and video conferencing tool. You'd all get your own accounts for Teams, so you'd be able to spin up your own sets of meetings. Um, none of this shared login stuff that we're dealing with with GoToMeeting today. Siobhan? Is there an online version for Excel and Word that would be, so you don't, so you'd still be able to use those tools, but you'd be using the web version rather than on your desktop. Okay. Correct. And the web versions are no match for the desktop versions, admittedly. Uh, so you, are you making a motion? 
Yes, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and make the motion. Um, I would like to right. move that the board approve an expense uh, up to uh, approximately $7,500. Actually, let me just say up to $7,500 uh, for us to provision uh, Microsoft Office for the governing board body and a few additional people such as the treasurer, the PM, uh, the clerk, if the clerk is not an employee and other people at the board's discretion. Second. Okay, so I think Sh Siobhan got the second in there. Um, Ray, an alternative motion in there. Um, but I see Jeremy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna try to merge or make a suggestion to kind of merge those two things. Um, and that language be added to Chuck's motion that it, that uh, administration of this be added to the administrative budget that the executive committee handles. Okay. Um, so let's let's get back to that in a second with maybe a formal amendment, but Tim? Um, I was just wondering if, is this replacing the Google package that you're dealing with now for storage? Yes. yes, Tim. Uh, so the Google package we have now is that some folks went and signed up for personal Gmail accounts, the free version, and we've done a lot of like inter-account document sharing. Um, so the idea is really to step it up into a centralized man and uh, centralized and managed space where we are collaborating on such things rather than the strung together free Gmail accounts. Okay. Um, just wondering why the Google Suite package wasn't considered instead of Microsoft. Just not a big fan of Microsoft in, in general. I, I understand. Um, for what it's worth, no matter which decision we make, we'll have people who are not fans because there are also people who are not fans of Google. Uh, that said, uh, the reason we selected Microsoft over Google, uh, Microsoft was a little bit more expensive. Um, Google was about equivalent to the entry level price if we did not have access to the desktop apps through Microsoft. But the, there were two key requirements that drove us to choose Microsoft. One, uh, Microsoft had a better package for government retention policies. And as a public body, uh, we are subject to certain retention policies that we need to make. Not to say that Google doesn't have them, uh, but Microsoft has them at uh, slightly cheaper plans. The other facet, and, and most importantly, is that because we cannot really use the online collaboration tools in the way Google intends you to use them, uh, without violating open meeting law, we're really subject to sending around uh, downloadable documents. Now, you can do that with Google Suite um, or, or Google Workspace, whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, and by you know creating your document in the Google Cloud and then downloading it as uh, you know a, a Word document or a, or a PowerPoint and then sending it along. Um, but by having access to the suite of desktop clients, it's it's for the people who need that. Uh, it, it sort of streamlines that because then you're working natively in those formats. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Okay, absolutely. Okay. And and by the um, way, I I actually 100% agree with you. I'm personally a much bigger fan of the, of the Google Suite. I I thought we were entitled to it for free as a uh, as a nonprofit type. We are not, I explored that option. And unfortunately they do not recognize our type of body poli politic, politic. Uh, you have to actually be a, a certified nonprofit per uh, the IRS uh, 503C rules. Okay. All right, so uh, I, I just want, want to read David's comment and then turn it over to Tom Allen and then Becky, so David says, this is the recommendation of the communications committee. There was a rather robust discussion about Google versus Microsoft versus ProtonMail and other things as well. So I mean, there was there were other options that were considered, but so yeah, so Tom Allen and then Becky. Thanks. So uh, in the implementation of this, are we gonna be moving over to Teams for meetings and and more in general, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is my only computer is my work computer and it's already got Teams and Outlook and all sorts of stuff that I have no idea that is remotely handled for me by somebody else. Um, I'm wondering if I'm going to have to go out and get another computer in order to help you know, keep participating um, or if there are options to get around that. Yeah. I know it's uh, kind of IT question tech stuff, but. No, that's fine. Um, the absolute easiest way to get around that is if you ironically spin up a, a Chrome separate profile 
in Chrome, Chrome lets you create different profiles, then you can actually log in to all of the CV Fiber tools and access the webmail, the, the web versions. The desktop clients are going to be quite difficult for you to use. Okay, uh, Alan and then Becky. So I have one computer as well. I don't have several. The one time that I have used Microsoft Teams, it affected a number of other things, including some settings and the way my account had been set up and so forth. Is that going to happen again when I start using Microsoft Teams? If, can it be separated from all the other software I use and I'm either using Microsoft Teams and doing everything there, it leaves everything else alone, it lets me do it the way I've always done it? And uh, if you leverage only the web-based versions, uh, did you all lose me? I, I, we see you now, go ahead. Okay, uh, once again, if you leverage exclusively the web-based versions of all the tools, um, then nothing will get impacted whatsoever. Um, now, I admit that's, that's not super ideal, um, although that's frankly what you'd be looking at if we use the Google Suite as well, because you'd just be looking at the, the web-based versions of tools uh, as well. Um, it, with the exception of uh, email, you can obviously pull it into a, a, your own client if, if you so choose. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not an easy solution short of creating a separate login on your machine, which you may or may not have access to do. Um, and so, you know, I, I acknowledge that that's not, not the best, but it seems to be the best for right now for us. Just a quick follow-up. Is there going to be training available? Is there online training for Microsoft? Is there, how's this going to work? They do have online training. Unfortunately, at the tier that we are buying, we don't get a ton of uh, support training or, or anything of, uh, of that. We do, we do get support tickets for uh, incidents around outages and things like that, of course, um, but we we won't get a ton of in-person training. So we'll we'll have to figure it out together a bit. And, and uh, fortunately, there are a few of us on the on the board who are a little more technical that can help aid in that. Yeah, I I I, I could do some one-on-one -on -one work. I'm not going to like put together like a, a bunch of classes or anything like that. But if you're looking to do X, Y, and Z, I can certainly walk you through how you start a you know how you start a Teams meeting, how you do document sharing, using Excel through your browser, that sort of thing. That's, you know, straightforward enough to do. Um, all right, so I've got Becky, Siobhan, then Jeremy. I, I just learned not to really raise my hand. Um, I was just saying, um, I, I, I have not had good experience with Google and I do use extensive Microsoft products at work. So um, I'll keep my hand down from now on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sh Siobhan and then Jeremy. I was just going to ask, if we do a group training session, do we have to warn it as a public meeting if there's more than 10 of us? Yep. Cool. Yes, we do. Okay, thanks. And so. also, I think we need the policy committee to put, put together Alan. We need to put together <laughs> um, some policies for how we can work together on things using the tools that we've got but i think we're going to have to need to see how things can work and i who's going to be our administrator are we going to have an administrator how does that work yeah okay that that's fine that that was it yeah big big and big thanks to chuck for taking that uh, that role on too so um jeremy then alan uh, one thought that I had is like for, for using the desktop Teams app, which I don't know about the web-based version, but one possibility would be to add like Tom's work email to the meeting list. I think that's a thing that you can do. Oh, we we, we can always approve people. We we can always approve uh, people to you know join uh, a meet. Um, and we'll have to do that for the public anyway, and still recognize that Tom is Tom, even if he's signed in via his yeah. work email and not his official CV Fiber email. Okay, Alan and then Tom, and then hopefully we can start uh, getting towards a vote. Yeah, I just want to throw up a red flag. I, the policy committee is not very good on personnel issues or on tech issues. 
Uh, I think I can honestly say that for us. And I think we want to be careful what areas we're straying into where we might need some help. And maybe that's why I was thinking about what kind of training are we going to get? You know, who gets who gets who gets the whole suite uh, and who doesn't is is not really something that a policy a policy discussion can work out. That's really a personnel issue, knowing people's skills and knowing their work. So I I I think there has to be a way to figure that stuff out outside of the policy committee. I, I just don't know how that would be handled by us, frankly. I'll think about it, but I it, it just strikes me as there's some work to be done here. Yes. Yeah, so Alan, if you want to connect to help shape your thinking on that, I'd be happy to kind of advise at least on the technical side of things. Yeah, it's, and, uh, it's probably the personnel side that, that I'm I'm most concerned about. And that's, you know, it goes back to the fact we don't really have we don't really have an administration, you know, we're not like a regular organization who'd have uh, HR people or personnel or whatever. Um, and I think that's kind of what that's kind of what we're talking about here. So let me let me think about that piece. That that's the one that's tripping me up right now. Maybe something will come clear on my next bike ride. So uh, but before I hand it over to Tom, if I could just do a straw poll, how many of you think you would need to use the thick client? Just is this even an issue? I mean, it's just a show of hands that you would want the full desktop application on your PC. This is this may be a moot conversation. Okay, Tom. Um, I'm depending if I'm still doing RFP reviews and things like that. I, I don't know if there might come up a case where you need to be able to review documents or make comments and stuff it might be important. But uh, the other comments about you know how to fix Tom's problem we're working at working is using his work computer. I think the answer is I could just stop being a freeloader and get my own personal computer. <laughs> um, and and honestly, I think keeping the stronger firewall between my work life and my uh, volunteer life might be beneficial for all parties rather than me having documents that we want to keep confidential on something that I have no control over the confidentiality of um, might just be the stronger way to go. But I appreciate the thought. Um, and in, in response to Tim's comment, uh, I, I, I don't know, is there a Chrome OS app or extension that lets them join the Microsoft stuff? I, th I think so. I think there is. Um, you can I'm certainly not use the web-based variants. So, okay. So we have a we have a motion, and I think if we were friendly amending it towards raise motion, so that we're essentially adding um, seventy-five hundred dollars to be added to the administrative budget for essentially for the executive committee then to be um, dispersing this as necessary. I'm I'm not sure that. It, it doesn't sound like really that there's going to be many people, if any, using the the, the thick client, the non-web version, because um, I think most of us probably have it if we want it. Um, all right, so that motion is out there. Um, are there any objections to adopting the motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any objections, so that motion passes unanimously. Thanks for that. Chuck, you want to do part two as well? Yes, sir. Um, OK. So the next item uh, the executive committee would like to bring to the attention of this board is uh, we are approaching the point where uh, being able to uh, rapidly respond to some smaller needs around advertising uh, is going to be a good idea. And so we would. Uh, Thank you, Ray. Uh, I'll continue with the context, but Ray has put the motion in the chat and I'll go ahead and read it um, for everyone. But uh, the, one of the direct examples of scenarios that came up recently is now that we are going to have people out in the field doing poll audits, uh, we want to go ahead and, and provision some magnets for the side of their vehicles uh, that have our logo so that they are uh, showing that they are truly representatives of CB Fiber as they are doing the work that they're doing um, to help bolster our, our you know, visibility in the community and, and ensure that people know that, that that's who they're part of. Um, and so uh, what, we, what we'd really like to do is move um, to add a line item in the administration budget for advertising in the amount of $2,500. Second. Second. Great. 
Um, a little additional context, uh, just that the um, the point of this is that the executive committee would be able to make the decision as to whether to appropriate these funds for various activities uh, or, you know, maybe delegate some amounts of that to the communications committee as the executive committee sees fit. Uh, but it would allow us to, to respond rapidly to ideas things like that. It's not a huge amount. Um, and we're not going to spend it unless we have, you know, good, good reason to do so. Uh, but that is the idea behind it. Okay. Any, any questions about that motion to add the $2,500 for the executive committee to spend on advertising up to $2,500, I should say. Okay. Any objections? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thanks for that. Um, moving on to the next item, construction budget for the executive committee. Ray, this is yours, I think. Yeah, so there was, let's see, am I on mute? No, I'm not, okay. Nope, we and um, uh, let me, I have, I'm typing motion here, let me rephrasing it. Do you want me to bring up the uh, the construction budget PDF or, or yeah, is this? Uh, okay, hold on. Stand by while I kind of get it sized right. And I'm popping into the chat room the, uh, what the motion is going to be. Okay. So some, some context for this, and that is that um, we're now going to begin receiving funds for the purposes of actually uh, doing the construction work, which is a separate um, item from the administrative uh, budget that we have. And therefore, we're going to, we, we're getting some grant funds, and um, uh, we need a, a way to track this. And um, what I'm looking for is that the governing board approve the establishment of a construction budget and authorize the executive committee to administer the budget. And on the screen, what you see here is an example that uh, Jer uh, Jerry uh, helped put together. And you see up there funding sources, for example. So today, right now, for example, we have some H315 um, uh, funding sources uh, for high level design for the, uh, for uh, phase, phases one, two, and three, as well as H315 budget for the poll inventory for phase one. And, um, and what you see here in the second uh, chart is you see a breakdown of, the, of those three items um, where there's, where there's uh, those particular funding sources. So high level design, non-WEC construction A, then you have the WEC area of construction B is the funding source. We have um, uh, Moretown Roxbury Northfield, for example, where we have some funds, $240,000 for this construction effort. Then we have a poll inventory where we receive $225,000 for that. The construction budget is just below that. And what you see there, in addition to uh, construction, high level design, poll inventory is also project management. Uh, the project management position is one of those positions that um, is in place during the during the um, uh, construction effort. Um, but when we get into operations, I, I expect we're going to wind up establishing an operations budget downstream, and that operation budgets will cover all the aspects with regard to an operator, ISP, and other um, uh, expenses and, and revenue streams uh, for that. So this is kind of it in a nutshell. Um, again, the motion is move the governing board approve the establishment of a construction budget and authorize the executive committee to administer the budget. Second. All right. Moved by Ray, seconded by Siobhan. What do you think? These are all, and I should point out that these are all for um, grants that we have you know, either received or will be imminently receiving. So there's no there's no, no no additional project tasks in here that would be coming from unfunded anything. Siobhan? This all, the, there's, I'm not seeing anything surprising here. This is all stuff we've been discussing for a while, right? This is, 
these are all numbers that we've seen and it, this is just formalizing a structure for it so that we can then do it, right? So if the executive committee can actually spend this money rather than coming back to the governing board every time uh -huh. we want to spend okay. uh, a, a bunch of money. So this is the governing board right now delegating the authority for these specific projects, delegating that authority to the executive committee. Got it. Phil? Thanks. And so the, these, will be, these will be paying contracts, paying for contracts that we've that we've approved. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Seems like we we approved the those expenditures with that. Okay. Good. Thanks. Right. Ken. Yeah, I guess I I'm not clear exactly what this means. Um, because in my mind, what we've now done now is cross this threshold with a very very significant dollar amounts. Um, what I par partly heard is that the, the expenditure of very large dollar amounts will now be will now be authorized by the executive committee, not the full body, and that troubles me. But it may be because I don't quite understand the sequence of activities that will get us there. Um, so I, I guess I, I until we have a construction contract then I don't want to hand over the, the authority to the executive committee to spend that level of dollar amount. When we get a construction contract, which will be a discussion of the entire governing board, at that point, it may, may make all the sense in the world to have the expenditures under that construction contract be dealt with by the executive committee. But I don't want to do that now. Right. Yeah, so um, all con all construction contracts are awarded by the board. What this, the purpose of a construction budget, similar to the administration budget, is for the purposes of when invoices come in from a contractor and um, uh, they're going to get paid, the, the process, like under the administration budget, is to um, uh, go to the executive committee who uh, approves, the, uh, approves the payment of the invoice and authorizes the treasurer to pay it. So this is the this is purely that administrative function of doing that. The actual bits about awarding contracts. So tonight, for example, uh, we'll be in the process of a uh, uh, selecting a project manager. For example, we have previously approved the um, the um, uh, grant applications for the other work. For example, for the high level design, for the pole inventory, for all this other work. Uh, is something that the board has already approved that we go for and we received it. And now it's a matter of uh, administering uh, to that. Any other any other thoughts on this? So I, I guess maybe just to, to rephrase what Ray is saying is that even though this is being called a construction budget, there's not really a there's not really a construction going on. This is all stuff that has come up prior to this, um, we will be uh, approving the, the contracts um, that we're looking to pay as an entire governing board. That was those, those contracts that we're looking at for the, the poll inventory in particular, those are, those. one of them just came in today or, or both of them come in yesterday. So, but, so we're gonna be looking at approving those um, on Thursday. Um, we'll, we're gonna call a special meeting to do that and we, certainly can't disperse any funds until we have a contract um, contract underway. So I have Phil and then Jeremy. Well, it, it seems to, to um, Ken's uh, point, uh, when we approve a contract, it seems like part of that approval would be also approving the executive committee to make appropriate disbursements under that contract. Okay, uh, Jeremy? And that's really implied here. So with the idea, I, so it, it's, it, I think, Ray, what the idea would be is that we would say make a motion to, you know, accept XYZ contract and to pay it out of the construction budget. Is that that isn't that isn't the motion at this time? Not this is not a motion about approving no, I, contracts. I I, I, okay. I understand I understand that, but when we approve contracts, 
like yes. for the full inventory, we would say that this is an item which would be paid out of the construction budget and the executive right. committee would not be allowed to spend money on contracts that are not put into the construction budget. Exactly. I, I mean, it seems like kind of six one half a dozen to the other, whether we approve the construction budget or whether every time we, you know, maybe from a budget tracking standpoint, it might make more sense, but I don't know. So, so the, there is an element too. Maybe this is what Jerry's going to say. There's an ele element too. We'll still be reporting back every governing board meeting. We're still going to see the treasurer's report, or we're still going to see sort of a, like a cash flow report, one way or the other. Um, but yeah, there's you know, w when we approve these contracts, the contracts okay. will have a dollar amount. Jerry. Yeah, I, I, I really, I don't think that Ken and Ray. Have have diverged here on on both of what they're what they're presenting. This is this budget is for planning purposes and to allow the executive committee to function with a with a with a timeline and a projected budget so that we have these funds almost in hand, close enough in hand to be able to actually put them put them in a in a in a table and plan against and that that's what we're presenting here that we anticipate these funds are imminent the 240 we already have and with these imminent funds this is how we plan on moving these funds through the pre-construction and construction process that has also been moving on a parallel track through the planning committee and the executive committee and the finance committee with no money so now that the money is is coming to fruition, this is this is the plan of of moving forward. I I, I hope I presented that correctly. Alan, Ray, if this were simply called a construction plan rather than a construction budget, would that still be correct and acceptable? Uh, not in my view. And and why is that? um well we've been we have been told that we're getting these funds mm -hmm. i mean this isn't we're not this isn't on a bet the funds are coming in and so what we're trying to do here is organize it in the fashion that we can manage it and track it and report back out to it not just to us but also to the department of public service which is a requirement and so this is that effort to um, organize manage and track and report but this is not an appropriation of funds, correct? No, this is not an appropriation of funds. Right. And I think that was Ken's concern, if I understood him correctly, that it, 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 it appears that it's a document that's appropriating funds for specific purposes. When I think the real, the real, um, the, the reality is this is a plan for how the money that let's say has been appropriated and the board has already accepted this is a plan for how those funds are going to be divvied up in the projects it is you see the distinction i'm trying to make all right have, um go ahead no, i was just gonna say uh, jeremy and, the, and then i want to circle back around to ken and see if you have any additional thoughts after hearing uh, the, the other commentary Jeremy. So one thought would be to have the construction budget be a value of zero. And every time we approve a contract, we add that amount to the construction budget. And then we can also track in the budget, you know, like anticipated costs that are not part of the actual budget that the executive committee has the authority to, to disperse. Ken, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I agree with Jeremy's point there that that I would not tonight approve the executive committee to spend amounts of money that are represented by that that spreadsheet. Um, when we have a contract for construction, or in the cases of the poll inventory, that's a time when that contract is approved that I give the executive committee the authority and and. I'll try to uh, give them the authority to spend upon invoice. But when we get to like construction, for example, 
the executive committee may have to decide to pay an invoice and I would rather the full body understand the progress of the construction before a smaller body, the executive committee, approves the invoice. Um, and and may, maybe as we approve a contract, part of the contract, or a large construction project, is a part of the contract is a requirement for the contractor to do progress reports that then make it easier for me to say, okay, executive committee, they're uncomfortable if they're on track. But again, when we get to these millions of dollars of expenditures, I don't want to um, delegate my authority to say a smaller body can approve the expenditures unless I am very, very confident that the contractual activities are consistent with what we agree, we as the large body agreed to in terms of the contract. Okay, uh, David, then Ray. Two things. One, we have already received grant authorizations for the money that's shown in these proposed budgets. You can call a budget a plan. It's not an expenditure. It's proposed. This is what the categories are. This is what the amount we apply for and received. And so we're setting up an accounting system. That's why I look at this. Regarding the, the issue of um, spending money, one of the reasons to have a project manager is to have somebody you can say, the contractor fulfilled the obligation that they said they were going to complete. So we got a couple of things going on, maybe out of sync. And um, I support putting this, we need a budget, um, whether, you know, who, whether the executive committee, you know, we've already approved the grant applications. We have approved the poll inventory contractors. So this is a way of somehow deciding how do we, how do the poll inventory contractors get paid? Does it have to come to the whole board every time? An invoice is submitted, or is it the executive committee can recommend payment to the contractor, and then it comes to the full board for verification. I don't, you know, in other words, I think there are enough, there will be enough checks, but, you know, I could be wrong. I have Ray, then Tom. Yeah, so um, right now, um, I think other than, other than the project management funding, which shows like 10 grand or something like that, uh, none of those funds are in hand, right? We don't have any of those funds, so we're not going to be approving payments of anything on the executive committee. The second second thing is that um, the motion is move the governing board approve the establishment of of a construction budget. I'm happy if the if that bottom document, uh, which laid out the construction. And the two things, and then the pole, then the pole inventory, or whatever, the design, all that kind of stuff, were zeroed out. The idea is to have a construction budget, and we can insert things into that budget. And when we insert things into that budget, you can all can make a decision about whether or not, um, as we go through half a million, three quarters of a million dollars in pole inventories, whether you want once those contracts have been awarded whether you want the executive committee on a monthly basis to make payments to those invoices when they come in, which is a kind of a perfunctory administrative, not unimportant, but uh, nothing to spend a, a board time on in, in my humble opinion. And so I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing to say it, it, it's the approval of establishment of a construction budget and authorization of the executive committee to administer the budget. That's where I'm at. Okay. Tom? You're muted. Thank you. Um, the way the motion is is written in the chat there, um, you know, it, it, there's two items. One is the construction of a budget, and the second is the administration of the budget. Um, and, and there are two different things intended by that, because it sounds like the folks who are, in char who are, who are pushing for this are, are suggesting what we want to have is a budget. And the folks who are are you know hesitant are worried about the administration of that budget. What does it mean here to administer? Does it mean go out and spend, or does it mean just kind of keep track of and make sure that it's up to date? Um, so would it be the same for you, Ray, if if that second part of the motion was removed, if it was just the establishment of the construction budget? I'd I'd be delighted even with that. And so when the <laughs> polls award comes through as we will do take the effort on Thursday night to do, uh, we can say that we approve the work orders 
and we authorized the uh, executive committee to administer the uh, uh, the budget for the poll inventory or not. And so, we can bring it back. Yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to ask ask Ken. So, if you would rather, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I understand where you're coming from. You would rather have these sort of big ticket items come back to the entire governing board for approval and for um, discussion at a, a monthly or semi-monthly okay, meeting. Okay, Jeremy. Oh. I, so, could, I, I hear could hear you just fine. Oh, must must just be Alan then. Did you hear my, my question, Ken? Oh. I can't hear you if you're I talking. Not. Oh, there's now there's a delay. I, I am talking and I'm I have a green light, but um, I did not I did not hear you until about the last ten words. Okay, I'm gonna tr I'm gonna try this again. Um, there seems to be a two or three second delay for with your your audio, but my question was, are are you are you hoping to see these big ticket items, the the payments of the contractors? Um, always come back to the governing board, the entire governing board, for review before they're paid out, um, rather rather than them getting paid maybe slightly more expeditiously with the um, executive committee. Am I hearing you correctly? I think you are. I, I, I'm, I'll just spe speculate. Let's say we have a two and a half million dollar contract and they're expecting payment on some sort of schedule um, that I would like to be a part of the um, knowledge that they are adhering to the construction schedule that matches that matches their invoicing schedule. I would like to be a part of that because it's such big big dollar amount, and we are a public body. That yes, that that's what I would like. Um, but I get get going back to the the earlier observation. I, I would also agree. Yes, let's establish a construction budget, and then let's use the poll inventory as our first example of what does the contract look like. When would they be expecting payments? I don't want them to get in the way, right? If they're if they're asking for fifty thousand dollars and and they've done X percent of the work, that that's fine. But I do think we need the practice to really adhere because again we're talking some very large dollar amounts and I think it is our responsibility to really track those as closely as we can. Um, hopefully over time we get better comfort and better process but that's just that's just where I am. I just when these big dollar amounts scare me as a public body to to not have closer um, knowledge before writing the checks. Okay, thanks for that. Chuck, you had your hand up. I retract. Okay. So in the interest of keeping things moving, um, it seems like we may have some agreement if we strike the last bit of the motion and we just essentially establish this as the budget. And at least in the short term, we make, make it the practice of bringing this before the entire governing board before we were paying out the, the big ticket items. Is, are there... Is that okay, Ray? So, um, so the motion would be move the governing board approve the, the establishment of a construction budget. Period. I, I don't want to. I don't want any tail uh, thoughts here about what's going to happen in the future with regard to administration. How we're going to deal with that. So let's just put a period there. And when the poll awards come through, we can have the discussion about how you want to manage that um, and who's going to how the approval process administration is going to take place. Okay, any any thoughts on that? Does that does that make folks generally happy? Is that okay, Ken? Excellent. Yes. All right. So, I think I think we've just um retroactively friendly amended that that motion. Any further discussion? Any uh, any other ideas about this? Okay, do we have any objections to this motion then? Okay, I see and hear no objections. So this motion passes unanimously. We have that we have that construction budget. Very good. Yeah, Ray. Yeah, so this is kind of a late uh, request for a change. Um, it's eight o'clock, no, 7.30 now. Um, I'd like to 
do the appointment of the PM. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a, maybe a series of executive sessions, but there's going to be a part of this that I should uh, talk about in public uh, before we go into executive session about the PM. And then, um, and then we come out of that and, and then we see where we are and whether we all have a stomach to go uh, longer. So I would I would still prefer to take all of the executive session all at once. I don't want to go into executive session and go out and in and out because then we lose our members of the of the public and orca and such. Um, I, if we can have a quick yeah, meta discussion, yeah. right? And if we could have a quick meta discussion then about um, it looks like, so we're at seven thirty. We are roughly on schedule but the schedule had us ending at 8 45 like i said earlier on i would prefer not to go that late um if folks are still willing if we can move the going public item and the network plan discussion to thursday like was originally pitched i think we will probably be able to finish this by eight if not slightly later than that uh tom it might be too late to be useful tonight um but i, I was talking to someone about how they handle executive sessions and manage to go in and out of them um, with frequency. And, and uh, their uh, tactic was to have a second meeting. Um, so the first meeting stays live and stays active and whoever wants to stay in it can stay in it while this, everybody migrates themselves over to the other meeting and then they come back once they exit executive session. Um, just maybe future, we could approach something like that rather than trying to navigate how do we get people to return after we come out of executive session. And and I think that's a that's a great idea. One, one pro, I guess I guess you, folks some folks can leave that meeting if they're bandwidth constrained. That was going to be my my main concern. Uh, Jeremy, um, one thought with that is we would then be paying CVRPC to sit and stare at a blank screen for however long we're in executive session. Um, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna make the executive decision here, folks, because I'm not hearing any sort of uh, any sort of excitement one way or the other. We're going to move the going public discussion and the network plan discussion to Thursday. We will we'll sort it out then. So I'd like to move on to the next um, next agenda item, the future meeting location. Um, I conducted a survey. We are getting towards the end of the emergency provisions of the pandemic. Um, um, you got my kind of wrap up discussion of what um let's see just i just want to see where my i can't find my old my own email anyways i'll try to just do this from memory so um there was some rough consensus that c coming back um and having meetings in person was probably the right thing to do um, there's always going to be a facility for folks to attend remotely. Um, I would definitely not want to take that away from anybody, especially if the roads are unsafe, especially if you do, do not live terribly close, um, things like that. But um, I think there's something there's something about having a meeting in person that's rather different than what we're doing here, and I think we've done we've done well enough given the, the constraints. But I think given that basically everybody here will be would be vaccinated by the ju the July meeting i would like to have the july meeting in person um, the thing that i would like to hear maybe offline from folks is how you want to navigate accommodating people who want to stay remote um, you know me sticking my cell phone in the middle of the room was how we did this before as as you might recall and that is that's a bad solution um, that said, you know, I don't know that we'll be able to get back into the school, but the school's Wi-Fi there um, may or may not, well, the school's Wi-Fi may be able to handle, um, may be able to handle the, the bandwidth for, you know, sending a, you know, a, connecting to a meeting, essentially. Um, I talked to the, the folks at the Grange, that was not gonna happen unless we wanna share space with the African drumming and dance group we can go downstairs and have the drumming upstairs perhaps. So that's not gonna happen. Chuck? Yeah, I, just, I, I just wanna call out that uh, I've spent over a decade working in hybrid work environments where there are some people on site and uh, predominantly my being remote. Um, and being remote 
doesn't work well unless you have the dedicated equipment and people who know how to use it to be able to facilitate the in-person portion of those meetings. Okay. So the other um, the, the other part that I, I maybe neglected to mention is that once the emergency order is is over, we may not have a choice but to have some physical meeting location. So which means somebody um, is would have to would have to have a physical place where uh, people from the public could meet. Um, and it's not going to be my house. We'll we'll put it that way. Um, so I think maybe what I'm asking for until we can settle on a um, a final central location, I, I will talk to the school soon, Berlin Elementary, for the, for those of you who who are you know reasonably new. Um, that's where we were meeting. I don't know that we will be able to get in there. That will be the summer break. The rules have changed. Whatever. We'll see. If any of you have suggestions. Um, and if you'd be willing to to reach out and find um, find a location that can comfortably accommodate, you know, twenty-ish folks on a regular basis, I yeah, I definitely love to love to hear about it. David, I saw your hand. Yeah, I was this a question for Christian at CVRPC? Do you have a meeting room that can handle twenty people? We do not. Um, we're going to be expanding our meeting room, but it'll still not be that big. I can find out where we do our meetings, though, or did before the pandemic when I was not part of the organization. Okay. Michael? Uh, last week, um, I was in Craftsbury Town Hall, and they were preparing to do a town meeting. And I noticed a piece of equipment that maybe others are familiar with. I didn't catch the name of it, but I'd be glad to find out that um, was some kind of camera device that um, could focus, that, that was triggered by voice, and so would focus on whoever was speaking in the room. Um, so this, this was a device that allowed a hybrid meeting, where there were people in person attending the meeting, yet there were other people on Zoom or some other uh, video conferencing um, software um, able to see each speaker and hear them clearly. Um, and in in this room, they also had multiple screens so that the remote people could be seen by the participants in the room. I, I thought that was a really good hybrid solution. And um, I don't know how expensive that equipment is, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's fundable under a bunch of different um, ARPA and other kinds of funds. So I'd be happy to look into it if that's something um, the body wants me to pursue. That sounds good. So uh, Tim, is that what you're talking about with the, the, the Mevo camera? Is that is that what Michael's describing? Uh, the, the Mevo has similar features, but there's, there's plenty of brands out there. Polycom was the industry standard for many years with uh, cameras that move based on voice. But uh, if you have a permanent installation versus you're just uh, renting space or borrowing space, uh, different story for different pieces of the hardware too. Okay, thanks Tim. Um, so Jerry, then Ken. Yeah, I, I'd just like to put something out there as somebody who's been working remotely since dial up. Um, it, it seems that for we're in the discussion, uh, in-person meeting is the default and I, I would like to disagree with that. Uh, I think what we've done over the past 16 months or however long it's been with the pandemic, we have moved extremely far and it has been so much more convenient to be to be able to do it this way, even when we all have crappy internet. It's been more convenient to do it this way than to have to drive in the snow and the sleet and 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 you know, after having already worked eight, 10 hours to get in the car and drive somewhere. Uh, so I would say that if we stay like this until we can provide suitable hybrid meeting where people have a real choice, that, that's my opinion. I don't have a vote. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Ken? 
Yeah, I've used the voice activated cameras before. They're okay, but I, I'm curious, can, can we use Orca to provide a feed to the um, re remote participants where Orca does a better job than any of the voice activated cameras that I've been familiar with? I don't know if Orca's done live feeds before. Um, the public access channel down in Northfield through trans video, they, they do that sort of like simulcast um, where they have, yeah, they have the camera operator. And the the difference with that though, is that people, um, it's not a two way. I don't know that Orca would necessarily be able to provide the two way communication that we'd really be looking for here. So we would still probably need um, some supplemental screens or something like that. Um, I think I have Jeremy and Siobhan. Uh, there's the Opera House in Plainfield is also uh, a possibility. Um, I know they do rent that out. That's a pretty big space. Um, they don't have any infrastructure as far as I know um, in terms of even a good internet connection. I'm not sure what the connection is over there, uh, but I can look into that. Um, the other thing is, though, I would echo what Jerry said. I mean, a lot of times I'm struggling to, you know, eat my dinner and just get online, let alone, you know, drive 15, 20 minutes, 45 minutes if, you know, Moortown ends up being the location like, like Chuck suggested. <laughs> uh, I, I just have trouble with that. Fair enough. Um, Siobhan? Yeah, I I was going to say the same thing. It's fine in the summer. I don't mind it in the summer. It's those driving home at 9 o'clock on a winter night is wicked. And even though I'm only half an hour from the Berlin school, it's still awful. And, it, and that hits, that starts hitting like around October-ish. And so half of the year, it's really unpleasant and it's really late and it's uncomfortable. Whereas meeting remotely, I just log in, I'm here. And then when I'm off, I'm, I'm home and, and everything's great. And so I really would prefer a hybrid solution if we can make that work. I'm just concerned we're not gonna be able to make that work and still meet the public meeting requirements that we have. So, you know, I'm not gonna refuse to attend, but, you know, I do have preferences. Right, and so, so so I should also point out the old labor hall might be a decent option as well as a as a central location. I can reach out to some of the some of the folks there. If you have an idea for a place that might work, at least in the in the short term, July, August, September, please feel free to reach out to them. And if they're open on the second Tuesday of each month, I would say just go ahead and do that that legwork. Um, I I don't think that we'll ever be able to get away from having to, having to have a physical space. Um, and I guess I would ask. Whoever's willing to do the legwork and find out the cost, the capabilities, um, you know, let's talk about who's going to go chase that down because um, I think we probably can't afford it, and we will certainly, absolutely, positively use it. Um, Chuck, to be perfectly clear, I am not volunteering for that last ask. <laughs> uh, I I just want to say that you know, open meeting law is pretty clear about. Um, allowing for hybrid meetings. The key requirement from the open meeting law perspective is that there must be a physical space where the pe public can attend, but it does not forego the ability for the, the, the body itself to be operating in a hybrid capacity. That is totally acceptable. All right, so I see a volunteering from, from Tim. Um, Tim, if you'd be willing to go and find you know, what does Polycom have? What is the, you know, what are the other options, the Mevo and such? Um, order of magnitude, reviews, and if maybe just bring a, um, if you just do a, a quick, um, get a quick analysis and then share it with me. And then we'll just, uh, we'll see if we can move on from there. Maybe have the executive committee take a look at it for a recommendation to the whole board. Yeah, I bought a lot of these solutions for uh, businesses I've worked for and as a consultant uh, for third parties. So I've been doing this stuff for 20 years or so. So I think I could make a pretty good analysis and give you some choices. All right. 
that sounds awesome. Thanks for taking that on, Tim. I, I definitely appreciate it. And uh, in, in, in the meantime, if you know of a place, uh, especially places that are re reasonably central, um, then uh, yeah, please please feel empowered to reach out and see if they have the, the space available. And then just let me or your other favorite uh, you know, executive committee member know. Um, okay. Um, I, I am seeing a couple of private messages. I'll, I'll get back around to those in a moment. Um, let's see. So we have uh, two executive sessions to, to talk about. One is the approval of the town ARPA MOU. And this is really not approving any particular MOU. It's really more approving the framework, the structure um, of what we're hoping to use as we go into agreements with other towns. To, to date, there's no towns that have a copy of this. We don't have, you know, we've not in any sort of concrete way agreed with for any uh, amount of funds. We will do that later. This is, um, but this is a document that we have agreed um, or that we're, ho I'm hoping that we can agree to approve tonight it has been reviewed by um, our attorney, so it's been it's gone through that. Um, the question that I have for you is that: Is there anything in this con? Well, there's nothing in this contract that that is sensitive, except that we are likely to we're going to need to negotiate this with each town separately. The towns are going to take this to their um, to their town attorneys. <clears throat> so before we can go into executive session for this one, there's the uh, the obligation that we have to find the um, the premature general public knowledge would put us at a disadvantage. If this contract template was made public knowledge, is that going to put CV Fiber at a disadvantage? Does anybody have that sense? Okay, I see heads shaking. I see heads nodding. Um, so yes, I Ray, think it's already here. I yes, it would okay. definitely put us at a disadvantage. Could you uh, could you tell me why? Well, um, this is um, I think my select board would certainly be uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> I our, my purpose here would be to put my select board at ease. To make them comfortable with uh, with the concept, um, and uh, um, and I think discussing the terms of this uh, uh, contract uh, in executive session would enable us to reach that point of uh, to find that balance, that equilibrium that my select board would be comfortable with. I'm not sure that uh, uh, that that's something that uh, that we could discuss openly without subjecting ourselves to serious uh, disadvantage. Okay. Thanks, R.D. Ray? Yeah, so we've talked before about um, this being a kind of a three-step process. Uh, one was to send them a letter, you know, make them, you know, getting, get, requesting an invitation to present to the board, and then doing a presentation to the board, and then closing the deal with an agreement. Uh, I, I think this that work needs to be done first before just sending a contract to someone. And by making this a public document, um, everyone's going to start talking about that without having had the background context um, and and back and forth with um, with the delegate or Jeremy, whoever's doing the presentation in advance. So uh, my view of the world is I think this would be harmful to our efforts uh, to prematurely to uh, disclose this uh, format. And, and my, my view of the world on this is that, um, it, and, and this would be where I'm coming from with regard to a motion, for example. And, and that would be the, the move the governing board approve the draft MOU as the basis for negotiating an agreement with towns for their contribution of ARPA funds to accelerate the development of a high speed affordable CV fiber community network. So this is this, this is just the basis, but 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 putting details out there, um, uh, the threads can be pulled apart on this before we even get started. Okay, Phil, and then Jeremy. 
I think uh, debating the terms of an agreement um, publicly it would it'd be very awkward because we could easily get into areas that that um, would put us to a disadvantage uh, before we, we get to a final agreement. So I, I thanks, Phil. Jeremy. Um, so say we entered into a contract with some town, you know, using this template as a base, would mm -hmm. that contract then become public? Yep. So eh, I don't know. I'm not convinced then that your point, Ray, is is very valid because if people are looking at the contract that we had with XYZ Town, you know, they'll start talking about that. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not maybe being very articulate, but they can talk about the contract because something is going to be public coming out of this. Alan, Jeremy, I I guess this is a, actually a point of order. What what is the question that we have before us? Is it to review and approve the language of the contract or, or the MOU, or is it to discuss whether it's a good idea for us to be going after ARPA funds from towns? So the the thing that we're looking to imminently discuss, perhaps in executive session, is um is that we use this template if we use this um this draft mou contract whatever that we use that as a starting point for our eventual contracts with with the towns should they decide to share their arpa funds but it's not we're not agreeing to sign this contract with any particular towns is that yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah, it does because actually the very first time I, I've now gone to my select board three times. Uh, the first time that I went, I was asked whether I had a proposal for them, which is kind of what this MOU would would do. And they were anxious to see something in writing. I don't see anything in this writing that is in any way proprietary or the revelation of this could put us at a substantial disadvantage. I mean, I think it's pretty clear to a lot of people that we're we're trying to work with our towns to get uh, some share of the ARPA funds that's coming to each one of them. I don't think that's a big secret. And even if it were a secret, I'm not sure it would be a protected one. I mean, th this is federal dollars. Anybody who wants eventually to know where the money has where any ARPA money has ended up, they're gonna be able to get these contracts. I mean, they, they'd be entitled to them, but we're not even doing that now. We're not talking about negotiating a contract or, or, or changing something for a specific town. We're just looking at the very specific language of a kind of plain vanilla document to my mind. Okay, Chuck. Yeah, I, 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 you, you know me, I guess at this point, I. I come from private sector and tend to err on the side of secrecy by default because I'm new to this. Uh, but I, I don't see anything here that I think would hinder. And in fact, I think if we could point to this and say, look, every town we're starting from this same base point, the same basis, you know, the, um, um, the same starting point. And of course, certain towns will want certain concessions perhaps to get us the amounts we're, we're hoping for. And if that's that, so be it. And of course, that contract would be, uh, you know, uh, confidential until I guess signed, um, you know, with the town. At which point it becomes public record anyway. Uh, I just I don't see anything here that that really concerns me about going out to the public. Okay, so we have uh, half and half ish here. Any other any other thoughts? Siobhan? Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is all, it's, I'm inclined, I'm leaning more towards the, this isn't something we need to protect because it's a generic template that's worded in a specific way. 
And the idea is we're going to give it to all of our member towns. To to or, or at least all the ones who are willing to talk to us about this and are willing to entertain this. Um, and it's not revealing anything about where we're planning to go. When we say we've got this generic template that this is what we're going to ask for ARPA funds from that. That's that's where I'm running into. I don't see why that's an issue. Okay, David. So this is not the document I bring to the town first. We better tell the town what we're doing and why we need money. And then you guys interested? And then here's later on, if they approve something, we go for it. We don't need an agreement until they have an understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. And maybe they want to participate. When right. I've already done that first part, though. Well, not everybody has, Siobhan. Yeah, okay. So so this this would be like the second last step. So I think as long as we can be completely clear that this that this is like a second last step, that we need to make sure that we have some conversation first. Um, I think probably the way to get through this is for us to have the motion and then approve it or defeat it on its merits and we'll and we'll go from there. Um, so we may not then need to, do we need to discuss this in executive session? Um, Chuck? Yeah, just to play this out, if we have the motion as Ray proposed in the chat, we have the document, we, we might probably will get a public records request for it at some point. We provide it to the requester. No harm in, in my mind. Um, I think we just go ahead and, and go forward with this motion as as is without bothering with the executive session for this topic. Okay, so I see, I'll, I'll see Ray's motion and Chuck, I'll take that as a second. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, Alan? There, there, there are one or two very small things that should be corrected before we do approve it, but I, I, I won't go into that unless we really want to. You know, things like commas and s's and stuff. Yeah, just, just send those, send those to me. I'll, I'll change the, yeah. I'll change the template. It's absolutely nothing substantive. Is there anything? So we have the motion. Is there anything substantive? Um, I, I did get some other feedback about um, similar. Things. Is there anything substantive that we should look at in this template? Can I move the motion? So our rules of procedure don't allow us to do that, but nice try, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, death, where is thy sting? <laughs> OK, so um, we, we have the motion. It was seconded. I'm not hearing any further discussion. Uh, are there any objections to? Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, Jeremy. I I'm just getting I'm still getting a ton of feedback from RD. Okay, I I just muted him. I will I will unmute him when, when we're done with this. Um, okay. So, so the motion is to find that premature public disclosure of this nope, would nope nope no nope. the last thing that Ray posted okay. so, so, so Ray, Ray for the purpose of people listening to this okay. with only audio could you reread it please. Certainly. Uh, move the governing board approve the drafts uh, CB5 or town MOU as the basis for negotiating an agreement with towns for their contribution of ARPA funds to accelerate the development of a high speed affordable CB5 community network. Seconded. Okay. So that was the that was the motion Ray had made before. Chuck seconded it. Um, I'm going to assume that we're all good with this unless I'm hearing objections. Not hearing any objections, no, no executive session necessary. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thanks for that. Uh, that was actually I, far less painful. I did hear something from RD. Was that an objection from RD? No, I, I unmuted him so that he could oh, okay. he could object if he needed to, but it was still a bit of feedback there. And that was feedback, okay. Yeah. Okay, so town ARPA MOU template, uh, we're good to go. Moving on to the, the next one. Uh, the appointment of the project manager. There is, uh, so the executive committee met about this um, and had a, 
um, had an endorsement of, so this executive committee was going to endorse the recommendation of the reviewers of the project managers, the project manager candidates. But because this is a personnel issue, this is a, the place where we ought to go to executive committee or executive session rather, I'm sorry. So um, because, uh, so, and I'm gonna paste this into the chat before I make the motion this time. So I'm gonna say, uh, pursuant to one VSA section 313A3, I move that we enter executive session to discuss the appointment, employment, or evaluation of a public officer or employee um, and we will make this hiring, the actual hiring contracting decision out of executive session. Second. Okay, thanks. So that was seconded by Jer Jeremy. And to, be, and to be clear, this is about the project manager, um, the project manager candidates. Jeremy, did I'm you gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pull myself out. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Christian, I'm sorry. Did you post, did you post that into the chat? Sorry, I didn't see it come up. Oops, uh, you know what, I was, I did not, it did not end up where it should have gone. So that was the um, the w one VSA, that was the, the reference there. Thanks for catching that, Christian. Okay, so um, any objections to going to executive session for this topic? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. I'm going to ask, um, let's see, Anybody who is an alternate or not a board member to please go. Thanks for everybody for showing up. Um, definitely appreciate your your time. Uh, Tabor, you are serving as the active, um, um, as the delegate from Marshfield in John's absence. So I would request that you, you can definitely stick around. Um, I saw a hand up, uh, Phil. Yes, I, I believe I'm the voting member for Barrytown as well. Um... Yes, indeed. That's true. And Michael? Uh, question, why, why do alternates need to step out? Because the alternates are not voting members in this in this matter. And Alan, I, I swear that we had this conversation yeah, before we did. about- Yeah, we did. So an alternate can stay there if the alternate is the evening substitute for the delegate. In other words, is acting as the voting delegate. But if an alternate is just hanging around and the delegate is there and is going to be part of the executive session, the alternate has to have a specific reason to be there, like the person has information that's important to the discussion. You can't okay. just say, oh, you're here, you're part of the organization, come on in. Otherwise, you'd have to open it up to everybody. You have to have a specific reason why somebody other than people who are supposed to be at the executive session or an attorney um, or anybody who has important information to give, they can't be in. I, I found the statutory language and actually posted it to the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Jeremy? So a question, would Michael be a person that we would consider to have important input, you know, given his knowledge of the, you know, the fiber market? Um, in selecting a project manager, I, I I actually think that that is a circumstance where yes, he he probably would qualify as somebody who has important information to give. With does does anyone? My personally, but okay. Does I think anyone... we need to make a motion. I move that Michael be allowed to join us in executive session because of the his experience on the fiber topic. Okay, so we will need to kind of retroactively change that we'll, to change our pre the previous motion because we're in executive session right now. Oh, we and did, we, can't. we went into executive session? We still have- Because we're recording. Are the recordings on and Orca's on? Yeah, I don't think oh, we're in executive I, session. No, we're not. Okay, I, I declared us in executive session and asked everybody to start leaving. I haven't kicked Orca or stopped the oh. recording yet because we oh. had, had not gone through all of the all of the necessary steps to make sure that we knew everybody who was going to be leaving was going to be leaving. Uh -huh. um, so we can retroactively say that we want to keep Michael on to to keep him in. If there's no objections, let's just go and say that that was the motion. If there are no objections, then we will 
you were all the voting members here anyways. So we, we good with that? Okay, so on that note, I'm going to boot Orca. Thank you very much, Orca.